Well, you are all listening to Castles and Cryptids, where the castles are haunted and the cryptids are cryptic as fuck. And the spies are crimey as fuck. (laughs) (laughs) And I am Lady Alana, if you didn't know. (laughs) Did we talk about that in the last episode or was that on just Patreon? Only on Patreon. (laughs) Oh, yes, Lady Alano. From yes. here on. Yes, for the rest of you. Um, <laughs> I w- it's not knighted, but it's yeah. uh, I was gifted uh, some land uh, thanks to my sister, who knows how tickled that would make me, and it did. <laughs> mm-hmm. And you get the little piece of paper that says, oh, oh, lady. this year in the year of our... Well, okay, so it says the year of the Lord or whatever, and then it was like under the reign of uh, Queen Elizabeth because Ressa bought it last year. Oh, so she was, it was still, I was like, oh, yeah, she was right. She was hanging on to this for a while. <laughs> but then, yeah, you get to, you own like a square parcel of land in Scotland. And nice. I'm going to make people call me Lady Elan. <laughs> yeah. On my way up to Dame. <laughs> You got to really work hard to get that one. I gotta, like, you got Maggie Smith. You got like all the Helen Mirren, all those British actresses. Yeah, I have no idea oh. what's involved with that. I think someone has to put a sword on my shoulder. But Pat's got one downstairs. So, <laughs> Yeah. King Charles might have to be involved. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but... I just hijacked the intro. What's your name? <laughs> I'm Kelsey. <laughs> we have fun here. Um, <laughs> yeah, if you didn't catch it on Patreon, I feel bad because it was a really fun episode. We talked about the yeah, magical, mysterious crazy. Mount Shasta. It was. And then I was listening to, and that's why we drink today, and they were talking about ley lines. And then it came up when they were talking about that. And I was like, well, of course Mount Shasta would be, like, part of the root chakra of Mother Earth. Because, like, duh, it's such a powerful yeah. place. I was like, why am I not surprised? Right. Yeah. But nice. I didn't finish the... Yeah. I, d- I need to know more, and I didn't get to finish the episode yet, so... <laughs> That's the worst. I hate it. being partway yeah. through an episode. I know. I just... I don't know. I was listening to it. I think I was cleaning upstairs and then um, Pat put the decided to put the movie on because we wanted to put it on in the afternoon so <laughs> Rain could watch it and Pat would stay awake this time. <laughs> oh, did you watch so, Everything Everywhere All at Once? Right, yes. Yeah, because yeah, Rain hadn't seen it and I... Oh, it's really good even on a rewatch. <laughs> yeah, I haven't rewatched it yet. Uh... Yeah. So good and also... Um, speaking of movies, we went and see, saw the Dungeons and Dragons Honor Among Thieves last night. Yeah, so how was good. That? What? I was hearing really good reviews about it. Yeah, like it's got a really good cast, like Chris Pine and Hugh Grant and Michelle Rodriguez, and then oh, the little redhead from It and everything else, Beverly. I can't remember her name right now, but. Oh shoot! Yeah, I she never remember. Drew- yeah. Oh, okay. So that's I was like getting all these. I'm like, ooh, that's what my character can do. It's just like morphing into all. It's called wild shape, and you like change into a bug, so you can go, you know, listen in on in a castle yeah. or whatever. You can sneak in and like do all this cool stuff. And oh yeah, it was good. It was really funny. So I'd recommend it for anyone. You don't even have to play or understand. <laughs> D and D. Yeah, all. I'll probably <laughs> yeah. download and watch it eventually. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we went to the theaters, and you know, nowadays you get like a little when you're watching the trailers, they'll they'll often have the celebrities giving you a a thank you for watching it in theaters, like you're supposed yeah. to. You're like, yeah, we rock. <laughs> like, look at us go. Brush your shoulders. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. It's like a hundred dollars later, but <laughs> right, so expensive. Right. I know I'm always on Pat if he doesn't get the discounted tickets through like my work, or you can get them through like places like Costco. 
yeah. if you don't have the scene points for it, then it's, yeah, it's expensive. And we went to the VIP, so it's even more expensive. But then you can get drinks and stuff like that. And mm-hmm. Kate, Caitlin got, like, a fish bowl. <laughs> oh, God. With a straw. Yeah, 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 yeah. Nice. And then, yeah, and then I got, like, a peach bellini thing that was pretty good. It was good. Nice. What did you do this weekend? <laughs> Uh, just worked mainly. Oh, <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then, yeah. And then have your nice. You always have a nice dinner with your parents usually. Yeah, no, no, just my parents for the last two weekends. Kate and Trav have been busy, so yeah, yeah. no little niecey poos. <laughs> no, sad. <laughs> I miss her. She's probably grown so much. I'm the only one that hasn't seen her in the last two weeks. (laughs) Yeah, they do grow fast. That's true. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, we hope you've all had a good week and liked the last episode. I put up some pictures on our social media. I put some on Facebook, yeah. Yeah, and then the website because I... For people like my brother, he was like, I oh, listen to it. And I was like, but did you look at the pictures yet? <laughs> yeah, you definitely have to look at the pictures when it's castles and things like that. It's... Castles and some, you know, possible ghost pictures, which yeah. I thought they looked pretty, pretty spooky. So, yeah, I it's definitely... creepy yeah. one way or the other. The one looked like a wooden puppet, like in the window. And not like yeah <laughs> it's like ah yeah. yeah the one that's supposed to have uh, either had a collar around his neck yeah or his and collar and it's like who's that jigsaw <laughs> right it looked so Giant creepy <laughs> yeah <sighs> yeah um, <laughs> but today what are we talking about today <laughs> we have another spy episode it's been a really long time <laughs> since we did Spies, and we haven't done it in a regular episode the last time even. It was yeah. in a Patreon episode. For so. our special peoples, but you're all very yeah. special to us, so we wanted to do it because we had a lot of fun last time. <laughs> yeah, it was so much fun. And yeah, hopefully if you enjoyed this episode, it'll inspire you to join our Patreon episode so you can listen to our other Spy episode and all of our other episodes. It's true. There's quite a few. Mm-hmm. And yeah. some of them are videos. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Videos where we explore Reddit or do tarot card <laughs> reading. <side> Reddit. <laughs> and yes, we do stumble our way through some. <laughs> we did some candle making. Light witchy things that we can find. Yeah. I burned some of my incense today in that like incense whatever you know it's like an incense mix type of thing and then you burn it on a little charcoal pad but i'm like how do i light this charcoal thing from it's like light it from below i'm like while i hold it this doesn't seem right oh (laughs) it's kind of difficult and i'm like i don't think i'm doing this right and then it like start to light and spark and so i'm like (laughs) drop it in the sand in the ceramic bowl thing that i bought yeah like, well it's burning but i'm like i don't understand how to light these charcoal discs like i guess just very carefully oh <laughs> without like i thought you would i thought you put like the stuff like on the charcoal and then lit the yeah. other stuff on fire but yeah you do put the stuff on top but then it's it does tell me to light the bottom of the charcoal and i'm like i don't oh, understand that's confusing <laughs> I have no idea. I have like incense fires and yeah, and stuff we'll see like if I pay that. The bed. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> yeah, but yeah. I had to... other than that. Oh, and then I, I had to. We had to. I had to delay recording on you because I just it's not done everything. And then like yesterday, I got caught up freaking finally bottling that last batch of wine that we. Mm. made out of the kits that we were given yeah so i was like we gotta get this into it's been sitting here and i don't know it's just been i'm like the weekend's over what happened right (laughs) i missed it yeah sunday night 
the things we do for you guys. Well, shall we crack into it? Yeah, I have a kind of wild story. It was one of the first ones I read about when I started looking up spies for this episode. And oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, and that is the story of Juan Pujol Garcia. Oh. And, yeah. So this is a, a man? Yes. He is okay. very cool. I feel like he probably gets talked about quite a bit, but I had never heard of him. And I didn't look up to see if he's really talked about the podcast, but I assume there's episodes out there yeah. about him because there was a lot going on i don't know that there's that many super famous spies really i mean other than yeah. fictional ones like james bond <laughs> yeah so um i've never heard of him so uh pujol i hope i'm saying that right i looked up pronunciation for like where he was born and that's what it told me pujol okay yeah we're going with it Mm -hmm. He was born on February 14th in 1912 on Valentine's oh. Day. Yeah. Is he a lover? <laughs> I think he is. He's definitely not a fighter. Um, <laughs> okay. And, he, and even when he is like fighting, it's not because he directly believes in it. It's just kind of a necessity at the time. Ah, oh, more of a yeah. pacifist. Gotcha. I think so. Yeah. Uh, he was born in Barcelona, and he was the third of four children. Uh, there isn't a lot about his background, but he was sent to a boarding school at the age of seven, and this school oh, was wow. mm -hmm, the school was about thirty-two kilometers or twenty miles from where his parents lived and the rest of his family. Uh, so he was kind of oh, okay. on his own there at at seven and he yeah. remained at this boarding school for the next four years like that's young but that's not too too far away you could easily visit yeah. on the weekends yeah uh every and that's what his dad did so every weekend his father would visit him at the school uh it, yeah <laughs> well that's his, good <laughs> his mother was a strict roman catholic who took communion every day well, his father was more secular and had pretty liberal political beliefs. So they kind of have like different oh. opinions in the household, but they made it work, it seemed like. The duality of man. <laughs> yeah. But that's cool. Yeah. At age 13, he transferred schools to one that was run by a friend of his father's, and he stayed there for the next three years. Uh, so until age 16. Uh, he ended up dropping out of school, actually, after having an argument when, with one of the teachers at that school. Uh, so then he chose to leave the school and he became an apprentice at a hardware store. Okay. Wow, yeah. that must have been some disagreement. <laughs> yeah, right? It didn't yeah. really say what it was about. Um, there's huh. actually a cool website. Uh, shit. I didn't have it saved as a bookmark anymore. What's it called? Um, <laughs> oh, his like name is Agent Garbo. Uh, so there's an agentgarbo.com website that has mm. a lot of information about his life. I didn't have time to click into most of it. They have a really cool, it's kind of like a point by point timeline of his entire life. And each one you can click into and it'll bring you to like a five page thing about that year like what he went through it oh was just my. too much yeah Yikes. but it'll be in my sources if somebody wants to look into it more um i mean yeah. it is it is easy to fall down into a rabbit hole because these people's lives are fascinating yeah yeah uh, which is why we wanted to do them even if it's not a strictly you know normal type of true crime that no, we normally no. do it's 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 in the realms of illegality and you know illicitness yeah. like it's it's covert <laughs> yeah yeah it, it can be true crime without having murder right i mean it has history. murder but that's that's just because there was a war going on 
uh there's multiple usually war going on so, yeah exactly yeah, yeah. <laughs> um yeah so he's working at this hardware store and then over the next decade or so he ended up studying animal husbandry so like raising animals oh why is it always called animal husbandry it's so weird i don't like it it does seem like an antiquated term yeah, yeah. but but it, yeah it's specific because it's not just like like a lot of farmers know how to do it because you, they have to have cows and stuff, right? It's like how, yeah, how he like studied you know, it, mating them and crap like that. I think. <laughs> yeah, it like <laughs> literally it. <laughs> said that he studied animal husbandry at the Royal Poultry School. It was a Royal Poultry, Poultry School. School. I know. He's I a chicken so boy. <laughs> yeah, but I was like, who won? Who wants to run the Royal Poultry School? The fancy chicken school. Uh, oh my god. And this is in Spain still? Or sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh so he managed to or so he goes to the poultry school, studies this animal husbandry. After this, he manages various businesses, including a cinema. So like he managed oh. a cinema. Okay. Yeah. Um, just dabbles in things and yeah you know, learn stuff <laughs> uh his father died in 1931 when pujol was at the poultry school and his father's death left the family really well provided for um like um... yeah it didn't say they were like super wealthy but they had a lot of going on because the family I think it was the dad had a factory and it said that the family was well provided for until the family's factory was taken over by the workers during the early stages of the Spanish Civil War. So oh, wow, okay. I huh. think it was well, taken have... over by like the people and then used towards the war efforts instead of them being able to use it for profits so it basically became mm. like a not-for-profit operation probably controlled by the government or something the oh, okay mate, yeah and yeah. i'm sure they got some like life insurance money when he passed also maybe could okay. have i didn't like, yeah. come across that but i'm sure they had something it was in 1931 so insurance and right. stuff was pretty common at that time yeah, and if he was like, yeah, owned a business, you would think. Yeah. So, uh, Pujol was conscripted into the military mm. service in 1931 for about okay. six months. Uh, this was during the Spanish Civil War. And right. So they they wanted him to go. <laughs> he didn't. Have yeah. A, a choice. He didn't on have that a one. choice. <laughs> uh, during this time, he knew that he was unsuited for mili a military career. He said he hated horse riding and claimed that he lacked, quote, the essential qualities of loyalty, generosity, and honor, which oh, I find God. <laughs> very ironic for how he lives out the rest of his life. Um, he sounds I like feel someone trying like... to get out of jury duty. He's like, yeah. really bad at lying. <laughs> I'm really, I'm really bad, I swear. <laughs> yeah, but I feel like he definitely has honor. I feel like he is loyal to the beliefs that he has. Okay. For sure. So, he lives by yeah. his own set of morals. <laughs> yeah, but it's a good set of morals. Uh, Pujol was m managing a poultry farm when the Spanish Civil War began in 1936. Uh, okay. His sister Elena's fiance was actually taken by Republican forces during the war. And along with like his sister's fiance his mom was also taken and basically held oh. captive they were oh, charged no. with being counter-revolutionaries and they were held i don't know quite for how long but it did state that a relative later helped rescue them from captivity like broke them out basically oh wow um yeah that's crazy <laughs> Uh, so Pujol was again conscripted into military service, this time for the Republican side that had just basically kidnapped his mom and 
Oh, okay. his like brother in law. Yeah. So he That's was be not awkward. happy. Yeah, he was not happy about this. Uh, he, he opposed their side due to their previous arrest of his family members. So instead of going with him, he ended up hiding at his girlfriend's house until he ended up eventually being captured during a police raid. And then he was imprisoned for a week. I mean, yeah, he's having a rough go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot, uh, lot going on at this time. It's, excuse me, that can't be easy. Right? No, what a life! Like it'd be crazy. Yeah. Um, and he's pretty young. Like by 1936, I think when this, yeah, 1936, he's 24. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. Yeah, like he's not very old when all this is going on. So that'd be pretty crazy to have to deal with um mm-hmm. so he was in prison for this week he was freed by a traditionalist resistance group who what? <laughs> i literally <laughs> have a sentence that says who his him <laughs> who his him who hid him it was supposed to be hid who his ah, him? ah <laughs> yes what had happened Jeez. was who who had hid him <laughs> Who had him? Uh, <laughs> I hide at him. <laughs> uh, yeah, so he's freed by this traditional traditionalist resistance group because there was multiple going on at the time. They oh. provided him with a fake identity document, multiple of them. Uh, and these documents actually said that he was too old for military service. So he used them kind of as protection so he wouldn't get conscripted again. But he's 24? Yeah, but these documents said he was too old. They, like, forged these documents for him. I'm old. He's Joey Tribbiani trying to play old. (laughs) I'm old. (laughs) Uh, Must be young. He puts on that toque or whatever. (laughs) I do not Or as you Americans like to say, a beanie. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Really dated, lovely friends reference. (laughs) Right. Uh, <laughs> so he went back to managing a different poultry farm, I think, but okay. it ended up being requisitioned by the local Republican government, and it was not. So once it was requisitioned by them, it wasn't profitable for himself in any way. Like he didn't make the money off of it after it was requisitioned, so he just kind Damn. of walked away from it. Um. This ended up intensifying his feelings towards communism, because this was what the Republican government was doing, and Mm -hmm. he ended up rejoining the Republican military using fake papers uh, with the intention that he was going to desert them as soon as possible. It was kind of a way just to get out of there. Oh, okay. He just forges papers to get in, or to stay out? Yeah, right. Depending on his Uh, preference. (laughs) So he wanted in there because he wanted to volunteer to lay telegraph cables near the front lines so that he could, like, switch sides and then, like, run away, basically. Because he doesn't like them because they killed his doesn't. He doesn't like either side. Like, one side, yeah. Um, Hmm. Yeah. He doesn't like either side. Um, So he's laying these telegraph cables near the front lines and he ends up basically fleeing um he successfully deserted and went back to the national side by 1938 however he found himself equally ill-treated by this side because he disliked their fascist influences and was struck Mm. yeah um he ended up being like hit and like beat and then imprisoned for expressing sympathy towards the monarchy oh no Uh, yeah so that's the yeah. thing about communism in practice versus in theory. It doesn't go as well. <laughs> yeah, both extreme sides definitely uh, have a lot of cons with them. You have to be careful. Yeah, people act extreme to enforce them. and Yeah, sure exactly. Uh, these experiences obviously left him with a hatred towards both fascism and communism. So both of the extreme sides and these far side political beliefs. And overall, it 
did say he was quoted as saying that during his service to both sides, he had never once had to fire a single bullet, which he said he was proud of. Okay. Yeah. So. Just fought with his fellow soldiers a lot because they were dicks by the sound. Yeah, probably, it. yeah. <laughs> Through some fast surprising. Yeah. But you call uh, these fascists. <laughs> yeah. Like this doesn't sound like a great environment. I don't know. <laughs> no. Uh after his discharge from the Nationalist Army, he met Araceli Gonzalez in Burgos and married her. Um, so this is his first oh. wife. Spoiler oh. alert, his first wife. They had <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh they had one only one child, uh Joan Fernando. I love the name Joan. That's a great name. Um, Joan Fernando. Hmm. Yeah. Araceli is a cool name. I didn't look up how to pronounce that because it wasn't underlined. Oh no. That sounds good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With their um, limited white lips. No. Yeah. <laughs> They're like white speaking, whatever. None of the rolling of the R's. Uh, <laughs> we are Caucasian. <laughs> yeah. So Caucasian it hurts. <laughs> so during the early stages of World War II, Pujol decided he needed to make a contribution for the greater good of humanity. Um, okay. Yeah, so now he wants to help uh during world war ii so he decides huh. he's gonna help the british because at the time um at this exact time they were germany's only opposition so the other countries hadn't joined in it was just okay the british versus germany so he says no, I want no help. allies really. yeah yeah um okay. nobody else has joined in so he says i want to go against germany i don't like them so his only choice mm -hmm. is to help the british so starting in 19 in january of 1941 he himself approached the british embassy in madrid on three different occasions including one time that may have been through his wife or with his wife with the offer to help during the war um as a spy like he's directly offering himself up as a spy uh but okay. in talking to the embassy they had no interest in employing him as a spy so i mean maybe you have to have experience like i don't know right that's kind of what he he lands on so he decides he needs to establish himself first as reliable mm. um kind of like reliable so then he can get in so okay uh, what he decides to do is he's going to establish himself as a reliable German agent. Um, so kind of like show yeah. that he's going to be kind of like playing both sides. So he's going to pretend to be like pro-Germany and like really hardcore huh. being like, I love Nazis and all this stuff. And then he's oh going to, once he's kind of gotten a reputation in um the german side and they trust him and everything then he'll reapproach the embassy and be like hey i have all these contacts do you want to use me now as a spot wow dangerous game yeah I um so this no is what he clips does. that sound so, bite <laughs> i love nazis <laughs> <laughs> don't do it please don't take it out of context <laughs> um so pujol created an identity uh that's called alaric Okay. And this was a fanatically pro-Nazi Spanish government official who would often be traveling to London for business um, from, oh. yeah, so he'd be like going back and forth um, in London from, uh, I can't remember where it, he was supposed to be operating out of. Oh, okay. A different, another base. Yeah. <laughs> um, so he ended up obtaining a fake Spanish diplomatic passport after he fooled a printer into thinking he worked for the Spanish embassy in Lisbon. Um, so he I mean, damn. Documents. <laughs> He's crafty. Yeah. Uh, he contacted an agent in counterintelligence uh, for the German side and approached them about how to become a German agent that would be working undercover in Britain. 
being like, mm. I want to be an undercover agent for the German side. And this agent so just like apply. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how he found this guy. Uh, yeah, huh. uh, the agent accepted Pujol and gave him a crash course in espionage that included secret writing. <laughs> He gave him a bottle with invisible ink, a code book, and 600 pounds for expenses. And wow. I love that. Real invisible ink. <laughs> right? Gotta have an invisible cool. ink. You're a spy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, his instructions were to move to Britain and recruit a network of British agents that would work on Germany's behalf. So that's what okay. he's involved with. Pujol instead moves to Lisbon and used ended up using a tourist's guide to britain along with reference books and magazines from the lisbon public library along with a newsreel reports i think that's just like news reports uh mm -hmm. he saw in cinemas to create credible reports that appeared to come from london oh uh, my god yeah he's literally just faking it till he mm -hmm. makes it <laughs> He reported back to German agents that he was traveling around Britain. He submitted travel expenses based on fares that he listed. Um, he found listed in a British railway guide. So it had these different oh fares. God. So you kind of add up, be like, oh, I told them I was going here and here and here. So like, what are the fares? Add them together. Like, that's yeah. my expense. Guess he can't um, Google it. <laughs> right? It's the 1940s. Uh, during this time, he was not traveling. He was, in fact, in a hotel in Portugal with his wife, and which the Nazis are wow. paying for, basically. Nice. Pujol was unfamiliar with the currency, like pounds and shillings, all that good stuff mm -hmm. um, that was used in Britain at the time, and was struggling with adding the totals up for his expense sheets. So instead, he just <laughs> provided them very detailed itemized. Um, just like every little thing he could put on there oh, and God. sent the detailed lists of expenses instead of total amounts. So they like extra believed him because it was so detailed. Uh, and he's making them do all the uh, fine accounting of actually. Yeah. <laughs> right. But he brought the receipts. So what can you do? Yeah. <laughs> Um, hmm. During this time, Pujol also reported back to Germany that he had created this extensive network of sub-agents that he called Arabelle or Arabelle. Uh, these agents lived in different parts of Britain and they reported back to him. However, this network was completely made up and <laughs> none of them existed. It's kind of oh great. Oh my god. Um, yeah, that's so ballsy. <laughs> Which is funny, because I don't think you and Pat, uh, I don't know if you had made it this far in Good Omens or not, but in Good Omens, the witch finder sergeant or witch finder general, whatever her name is, he does this exact oh. same thing. He makes the fake, he has a whole bunch of fake spies that quote unquote work under oh. him, and then he's providing Crowley with expense reports to get money out of him, and he's like, Agent Spoon uh, died last month, and I need to send flowers to his wife. And he's like, "Yeah, yeah, add it on the report." And then, like, all this stuff. Was it like, really an Agent Spoon? <laughs> no. Um, no, I didn't. Yeah, they I have, didn't like, make it very far in that. Oh, show. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, oh yeah, they do the same thing. So it's like, oh my god, it really happened somewhere. This is kind of fun. Um, <laughs> I need to watch that. I've just been watching bullshit at night and. <laughs> oh. Yeah, one time Netflix one. didn't even want to work and I had to watch 48 hours and it had commercials that I couldn't fast forward. <laughs> oh no. It was on demand. <laughs> no. It was crazy uh, how this, this person worked at a bank and they like were like, we're going to kidnap your daughter and kill her if you don't go rob your own bank. I'm like, it was nuts. Oh jeez. Yeah. It would be anyway. scary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she was fine. Uh, <laughs> that's so, Shit yeah, ton this... of PTSD, you know. But <laughs> Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so this uh, spy network that he says he has operating under him is completely made up. None of them exist. <laughs> uh, Pujol ended up making several mistakes during his reports back to Germany, such as using the metric system in the UK, <laughs> which they don't use, um, including one thing yeah. that said about... That's weird. 
I think he said the wrong type of alcohol was being drunk by like somebody in a pub and like <laughs> all this stuff. Yeah. It's <laughs> like okay. Like the wrong Okay, so Yeah, never, like, like he called drink. it. He like called it something oh. and they're like, No. Like that's the wrong word for it or something and it's like, Well, whatever. Right. That would make sense. They have some pretty specific British terms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so often these messages, as you can imagine, were intercepted by British Ultra Communications Interceptions mm. Program. Ultra uh, Communications. Go yeah, love the an ultra. ultra. <laughs> <laughs> um, these were British Counterintelligence Services MI5, and they believed that these messages back to Germany from Pujol were real. And they ended up launching a full-scale spy hunt for these so-called operatives that were operating no. under control. That's so embarrassing for them. Yeah. <laughs> um, it just shows how believable, because they're like, oh shit. Yeah, like, yeah, like he's um, compiling things with fake news footage. He's like the original yeah. fake news maker. <laughs> yeah. Um, so by February 1942, either Pujol or his wife approached the u.s uh after it had entered and joined the war they contacted a navy lieutenant in the office at lisbon and offered their services again as like undercover spy this lieutenant mm. saw pujol's potential and ended up contacting his british counterparts on the couple's behalf um so now he's officially like in in with the british which is cool because all that was happening worked. while he's independent like he's just doing it himself like it's wild True. N nobody's there helping him um, right like it's pretty impressive <laughs> yeah so the british at the by this point had been aware that someone was misinforming the germans and realized <laughs> the value of what they called wasting resources in attempting to follow up on Pujol's fictional reports of the British movements. So they basically oh. <laughs> decided that, because that's what Pujol was doing, he was sending all these fake reports to them so that the Germans were wasting all of this money trying to follow up on all this stuff that he was telling them right. that was just bullshit. None, it was all meaningless. So he's just wasting yeah. their time and focusing yeah. their efforts where it didn't need to be. Here's some um, busy work. <laughs> yeah. So Pujol was officially moved to Britain in 1942. He was given the code name uh, Bovril uh, after Ooh. the drink concentrate. I don't think that's oh. around anymore. Bovril. <laughs> uh, Let us know <laughs> if you've Yeah, B O V R I L. Bovril. Oh, weird. I want to know what it tasted like. Um, yeah. So, yeah, he is now officially in with the British. After he passed a security check conducted by an MI6 officer, he was partnered M up with the MI5 agent Tomas Harris, who was one of the only fluent, like, Spanish speakers um, at MI5. And he briefed Pujol on how he and Harris should work together. Um... And Pujol's it wife. It's the original BP it hot like? drink that has been keeping Britain's chin up for decades. It sounds like, okay. like a like what a packet that you use to make like a beef broth or something. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> it's not know. Kool Aid. It's not Kool Aid. We're not drinking oh. the Kool Aid. <laughs> We're eating the Marmite or some other weird shit. <laughs> Let us know, UK listeners. Do you guys still do drink this? Yeah, I don't know. yeah, um, yeah. And then <laughs> Pujol's wife and child are then also moved to Britain shortly after, not at the exact same time. Um, okay. So Pujol originally was operating under a case officer, Cyril Mills, who, um, the only reason I mention him is because he actually ended up giving Pujol his final like code name um oh so yeah mills later reassigned him because mills didn't speak spanish so he wanted pujol with somebody that spoke spanish um because that was pujol's first language okay um but even before this mills was 
the one that ended up recognizing Pujol's extraordinary imagination and the accomplishments he had made even while being an independent agent and suggested that his codename be changed um, from Bovril uh, because he was, quote, the best actor in the world. And because of this, Bovril became Garbo after Greta Garbo. Oh, yeah. heard of her. Mm-hmm. So I guess it's better than being named after a, a beef tea <laughs> sort of drink. Beef tea. <laughs> beef juice. <laughs> oh, beef juice. <laughs> um yeah so now he's garbo okay i'm done (laughs) uh so pujol was reassigned with now harris tomas harris as his case officer um okay the next little bit i have is oh a few things from wikipedia because they had little summaries i liked uh it said quote together harris and pujol wrote 315 letters averaging 2,000 words each addressed to a post office box in lisbon supplied by the germans his fictitious spy network was so efficient and verbose that his german handlers were overwhelmed and made no further attempts to recruit any additional spies in the uk and that was according to the official history of the british intelligence in world war ii uh wow that sounds yeah so like they were gonna make this whole network and he was gonna be part of it but because he had made his quote-unquote own network they decided his was so efficient they sent no other spies into britain which is really good like that's amazing work yeah Um, like he and his guys talked and wrote enough letters (laughs) yep uh And then continuing from Wikipedia, it said that the information supplied to German intelligence was a mixture of complete fiction, genuine information with little military value, and valuable military intelligence that was artificially delayed. So what they Mm. would do is they would send, like, factual information about what their military was doing, but they were intentionally delaying it um and holding it up so that it would arrive after the germans like had already figured that out themselves but in him sending it or them like post-dating it it would seem like he was actually feeding them information oh yeah because otherwise it would certainly get suspicious (laughs) yeah absolutely (laughs) um and it also said that after one such intentionally delayed letter, Pujol received back from the Germans, quote, we are sorry they arrived too late, but your last reports were magnificent. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, they're just like, yes, yes. Keep, I mean, that keep was good info. Good. We already knew it. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. Um. So shortly after and many delayed messages later, the Germans requested a speedier and more effective efficient way to communicate with him than by letter and because of this harris and pujol created a fictional radio operator um and from (laughs) the 1943 on they communicated mostly by radio um so now they're over the radio okay um yeah Oh, the rest of this is from Wikipedia, too. On occasion, he had to invent reasons why his agents had failed to report easily available information that the Germans would eventually know about. For example, he reported that his fabricated Liverpool agent had fallen ill just before a major fleet movement from that port. And because of this, they were unable to report the event because they were sick. Uh, to support this story, <laughs> the agent, right? To support this story, the agent eventually died, and an obituary was placed oh. in the local newspaper as further evidence to convince the Germans. The Germans were also persuaded to pay a pension to the agent's widow. Oh my god, love. Agent Spoon! Rip yeah. Agent Spoon! <laughs> I love it. Why do I have to be Agent Spoon? I want to be Agent Mr. Pink. No. <laughs> yeah. Right? Fucking now they're paying a pension. I love it. Nice. Waste their money. <laughs> Waste the Germans' money. Um, 
so also from Wikipedia, it said for radio communication, Alaric, which is the name of his, um, when he's undercover with the Germans, that's his code name. Oh, so he's okay, Garbo, right. he's Garbo with the British, he's Alaric with the Germans. Uh, <laughs> so they said that Alaric needed the strongest hand encryption that the Germans had because he's doing so much good work over there. So the Germans provided Alaric with this system which was in turn then directly supplied to the code breakers at uh, Bletch Bletchley Park. Um, this was on like the British side. So he just like, handed it right over to the British. They're like, this is the best encryption the Germans have? Sweet, directly to the British. Uh, <laughs> and Garbo's, crazy, this yeah. part kind of yeah. confused me, but it said that Garbo's encrypted messages were to be received in Madrid manually decrypted and re-encrypted with the with an enigma machine for retransmission to berlin so like that's how they had to like communicate okay. that part kind of confused that's, me yeah it's very convoluted and <laughs> yeah time consuming that's... yeah um also but be... those machines sound so cool yeah. yeah yeah i watched the imitation game which had um alan oh, turing right. and everything for because he's the one i think he made the original enigma machine or something well, okay i didn't actually see it but <laughs> mm. i think it has benedict cumberbatch something. yeah nice yeah him and uh kira knightley i think plays the wife okay yeah i like her um mm -hmm. yeah it was pretty good um so because of this like encryption de-encryption re-encryption thing um <laughs> the british were left with both the original text and the enigma encoded interception of it and because of this the code breakers had the best possible source material for what what wikipedia called a chosen plain text attack on the germans enigma key so i think that just helped them figure out the system with which they were changing because I think they changed it every day mm -hmm. or every 12 hours or something like slightly so this oh just kind of helped them keep up with that yeah it was wow. crazy that's why it was so hard to break is because it was constantly being changed mm, um, maybe it's like sort of having some sort of answer key type thing almost yeah because like all the characters would like shift or something like one liner uh, every yeah. day so if you were like trying a to break wouldn't it be one anymore it'd be like two or something. yeah and it was changing every single day so if you hadn't decrypted like yesterday's message it was worthless now like you only had that days mm. to decrypt and yeah um dang <laughs> so that brings us to operation fortitude which is pretty cool this just <laughs> makes me so happy so in january 1944 the germans told pujol that they believed that there was going to be a large-scale invasion in Europe and this was imminent and they asked to be kept informed. So they wanted up-to-date information on what they were doing. Uh, this invasion was actually called Operation Overlord and... Oh god. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Crazy name. And to protect its secrets, Pujol and his team created Operation Fortitude, which was a deception campaign that involved sending over 500 radio messages that included up to 20 a day with incorrect or misleading information. And okay. yeah, during the planning of the Normandy beach invasion, the Allies believed that it was vital that the Germans believed that the invasion would be landing at the Strait of Dover instead of Normandy. And they oh, fed that yeah. information through uh, Pujol. Okay, cool. Yeah. So mm -hmm. they had no idea it was going to be at Normandy. Yeah, he was like pointing them elsewhere. Huh. And in order to keep credibility with the Germans, he was allowed to leak some minor details of the actual invasion. But at a later time, uh, like it was going to be held back or intentionally delayed, making it impossible for them to take appropriate or effective action in time mm -hmm. for it to make a difference. So arrangements were made for German agents to wait on the line for information. So they're waiting 
uh, Pujol was supposed to have an agent that was going to radio them with the information. This information was too late um, because they, the German agents are sitting, waiting on the line and waiting and waiting. And Pujol's quote unquote network never sends the information. And when it did, it was proven accurate, but now out of date because it had already happened. Oh no, and they were just sitting there watching their phone with the three little dots, like, <laughs> no, it's coming, yeah. they're typing. <laughs> yeah, the 1940s equivalent of that. Like, da 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 da. Um, like watching your, I was going to say typewriter, what's the thing? The, do, 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 oh. The telegram? <laughs> yeah. I think yeah, that, that one. <laughs> I was going to say Morse code. <laughs> the Morse code's like right. what it does, not what it, the right. machine is called. <laughs> the machine is not called Morse code. Um, so this part kind of confused me when I wanted to include it because this is kind of wild this was from Wikipedia it said on June 9th three days after D-Day Garbo sent a message to German intelligence that was passed to Adolf Hitler and the Oberkommando der oh my god I don't even know how to pronounce that word <laughs> too many it looks like yeah, it was just the German High Command. So it sent to Adolf Hitler and the German mm -hmm. High Command. In this, it said, Garbo said that he had conferred with his top agents and developed an order of battle that showed 75 divisions in Britain. Um, so they were like crazy, like 75 armies. And there were only about 50, actually, not 75. Part of the Fortitude Plan or Operation Fortitude was to convince the Germans that the fictitious formation, the first U.S. Army group that comprised of 11 divisions or 150,000 men, um, that was commanded by General George Patton, that they were stationed in the southeast of Britain. Um, okay. So they're basically feeding them like there's way more than there's actually yeah. going to be in there in the in this other place. Right. right, um, right. This deception was supported by fake planes, which there's actually, um, there are some pictures in the drive. You can look at this. I do have a picture of what was called an inflatable tank. Um, because Why does that sound familiar, but oh, so awesome? <laughs> I love it. So oh yeah, they're telling God. them there's all these extra people. There's all these other like divisions or battalions that are coming. So because of this, they needed fake planes. They needed inflatable tanks and vans that were just going to be traveling about the area, <laughs> transmitting all these bogus radio, like blah, 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 blah stuff, like move into position oh and all this stuff. And it's just nonsense. It's a, it's a deep fake. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, it would look pretty good from afar, actually. Yeah, I mean, it looks so realistic, that tank. I was very impressed with how it looked. Like, I mean, there's there's some parts that seem a little too rounded, like a little bouncy castle-ish. Yeah, <laughs> but, but if that, you're... It's, pretty, it's got, like, the vines or whatever details yeah. cover in it and stuff. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. It's pretty good for the 1940s, like... Um... That's crazy. I think I have heard that before because when you said that, yeah. like, it sounds insane, but then I'm like, I think I've heard this once before. Right? Yeah. Like, the... That's insane that they would go yeah. to those lanes. Yeah, I was like, that's so cool. <laughs> um, oh my god. Yeah, so they're traveling and all the stuff. Garbo's message pointed out that units from this formation had not participated in the invasion, and therefore the first landing should be considered a diversion. So now they're, like, saying, like, the people over there mm. that you guys are focused on, they're a diversion. These people oh, are the no. real people you should be watching. Sure. Uh, a German message to Madrid sent two days later said, quote, all reports received in the last week from Arabel, um, or the spy network undertaking, mm -hmm. have been confirmed without exception and are to be described as especially valuable. Um, so they are given, oh, like, the top priority. Any of his communications are now, like, the end-all be-all. What he says goes. Uh, hmm. Yeah, because they're just so credible. A post-war <laughs> examination of German records found that during Operation Fortitude, no fewer than 62 of Pujol's reports were included in the, oh my god, there's that abbreviation, what was it? The German High Command Intelligence Summaries. 
So they used oh. like 62 of his reports. Um, or like oh, okay. Stuff they sent, he sent them. Um, they accepted Garbo's reports as completely true. And they ended up keeping two armored divisions and 19 infantry divisions in the Pasta Callus that was waiting for a second invasion through July and August 1994. So they were holding all these people back because of what he said. So they weren't joining in the fighting. They were like holding half their army back because they thought it was a diversion. Um, The German commander in chief in the West, Field Marshal Gerd von (laughs) Rundstedt. None of these were underlined. You betrayed me. You betrayed me, word. Um, (laughs) (laughs) We'll never be able to say it with that proper thick accent anyway. (laughs) Get Um, hard. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. He refused to allow the general Erwin Rommel um, to move these divisions to Normandy. And there were more German troops in this region two months after the Normandy invasion than there had been on D-Day. Um, So there was more of them that were held back than were there um, during the storm of Normandy, which is crazy. So he made that happen, which is, (laughs) yeah. yeah. Um, Wow. In late June, Garba was instructed by the Germans to report on the falling of V-1 flying bombs. Okay. Um, finding no way of giving false information without arousing suspicion and being unwilling to give correct information, Harris arranged for Garbo to be arrested. Um, so that was like his okay. candler. He returned to duty a few days later, now having a need to avoid London. So like an excuse basically to say, I can't stay in London. I was just arrested basically, to the Germans. Um, Okay, okay. He forwarded an an official apology letter from the Home Secretary for his unlawful detention. So he basically is apologizing to the Germans. I'm so sorry you got arrested, and I couldn't give you that information because I was arrested at the time. No, 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 no. Um, (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So... Uh, in summary, all this stuff he ended up doing, it said that the Germans paid Pujol about 340,000 pounds US in the 1940s, which I looked up and converted. It's almost $4 million. Oh, boy. Yeah. That's a chunk um, of change. <laughs> yeah, so he cost them $4 million during the war, um, over the course of the war, to support his network's agents, which at one point totaled 27 fabricated characters, which are like... Um, <laughs> There is even a picture in the drive. It's kind of laid out. Like it tells you what title each person has, their full name. There's little spots about them, like if they're married, like all this stuff, kids' names, any little detail he ever mentioned, oh they like God. kept track of. Um, That's so yeah. much <laughs> to remember. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Pujol acting as a Laric. Um, on the German side, he was awarded the Iron Cross by Germany in 1944. This award nice. was normally reserved for frontline fighting men and did require Hitler's personal authorization. So he was awarded this via radio. It wasn't done oh, in person. Oh, from the Germans, right. Okay. Because mm-hmm. the Germans <laughs> didn't know he was betraying them. Keep that in mind. They didn't find out until a really long time after. Uh, <laughs> uh, so as Garbo, he received what I think is the best... The best name ever. Uh, (laughs) The most excellent order of the British Empire. Oh my gosh. The most excellent. Flowery names. Yes. Um, It's great. Well, you know, Thor John Gray in the Outlander series or whatever. Mm -hmm. He's like part of, he goes, he keeps going to this pub or whatever, or this gentleman's club that's like something like the high society or the oh, gentleman who appreciate beefsteak club. It's got a really weird sound <laughs> name. Uh, Which is made even funnier by the fact that that character is a homosexual. But yeah, um, their names are just like... 
<laughs> You're like, what? It's like a, you know, country club or something you'd have today, I guess. Like, yeah. Or the old boys club. But yeah, it's, it's like the society for the appreciation of the beef steak. And I'm like, every time I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> right? uh, who named this? <laughs> yeah. Just call it sausage fest. Uh, sausage party. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so he gets this, the most excellent order of the British Empire from King George VI mm. in 1944. Um, it also said that the Nazis never realized they had been fooled. And because of this, Pujol, along with a gentleman named Eddie Chapman, that was another double agent, earned the distinction mm. of being um, two of the very few to receive decorations from both sides during <laughs> World War II damn yeah um, that would be a very few <laughs> yeah uh obviously after the war pujol was fearful um that like the nazis would figure out what happened and any surviving nazis may retaliate against him so with the mm. help of mi5 he traveled to angola and faked his death um as a oh result of malaria in 1949 said he then moved to Venezuela where he lived in relative like relatively anonymously and this is so cute he spent <laughs> his time running a bookstore and a gift shop uh Ooh, bookstore mm -hmm. <laughs> on the not so cute side on wikipedia it said Pujol divorced his first wife and oh, another yeah. source said possibly didn't even tell her and the kids that he was not dead and then it was fake Oh, no. Which is really shitty. Yeah. yeah not a good look. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, I don't know. I wanted to mention both. He either divorced her and, or she didn't know he was alive. Um, oh, great. And he married his second wife, Carmen Celia, uh, with whom he had two sons, Carlos, Carlos Miguel and Juan Carlos. And a okay. daughter. He used to work with the up... Juan Carlos. <laughs> yeah. And then his son, who was Juan Carlos Jr. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, they also had a daughter who died in 1975 at just the age of 20. Um, yeah, I don't know how that happened. By 1984, Pujol had moved uh, his son Carlos Miguel, or had moved to his son's Carlos Miguel's house in Trinidad. Oh wow! Um, so that's where he was living by the 1980s. But in 1971, politician Rupert Allison, writing under the pen name Nigel West, uh, oh. became interested in Agent Garbo. For several years, he entered very, interviewed various former intelligent officers, but no one knew Garbo's real name. Eventually, Tomas Harris's friend Anthony Blunt, who was a Soviet spy who had penetrated MI5, said that he had met oh. Garbo. <laughs> And knew him as either Juan or Jose Garcia. Uh, okay. Allison's investigation was stalled from that point until March of 1984, when a former MI5 officer who had served in Spain supplied Pujol's full name. Allison hired a research assistant to call every J. Garcia, an extremely common name in Spain, in the Barcelona phone book and eventually yeah. contacted Pujol's <laughs> nephew. Pujol and Allison finally met in New Orleans in May 20th, 1984. At Allison's urging, Pujol traveled to London and was received by Prince Philip at Buckingham Palace in an unusually long uh, attendance. So they talked for a really long time. Okay. Um, after that, he visited the Special Forces Club and was reunited with a group of his former colleagues, including T.A. Robertson, Roger Fleetwood Hesketh, uh, the Cyril Mills that gave him his name, and Desmond oh, yeah. Bristow. Um, on the 40th anniversary of D-Day, or Normandy, uh, June 6, 1984, Pujol traveled to Normandy to tour the beaches and pay his respects to the dead. Nice. Um, I only have a, not too much more. Pujol died uh, in Trinidad in 1988. He is buried in 
Chironi, a town inside Henry Pitter National Park by the Caribbean Sea. Sounds oh, lovely. Sounds pretty- yeah, it does. It does. <laughs> Uh, Thomas Harris, Pujol's security service handler, left the service after the end of the war. He spent much of his time in Spain and unfortunately and sadly was killed in a car crash in Majorca in 1964. Majorca. 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 <laughs> Majorca. Yeah, I can't remember. It's an island? Oh, I'm yeah. blanking. <laughs> um, yeah, but sadly he died in 1964 um, in that car crash. Um, okay, the handler guy. Okay. Yeah, Thomas right. Harris that like really worked so much with him, the two of them. Um, because uh, Harris had died, the security service released Thomas Harris's case file on Garbo, like as an agent, but obviously not his identity, um, but just like all their workings together. To the oh, public okay. records officer, now that's called the National Archives, in January 1999. Oh, the archives. <laughs> the archives. Uh, Harris. That's what I call them. <laughs> um, I think this is what Harris called them. It said Harris's, quote, summary of the Garbo case, 1941 to 1945, is also published in the oh. PRO's Secret History Files series, entitled Garbo, the Sip. Garbo, the spy who <laughs> saved D-Day, um, Ooh, and has like title. the intro. Yeah, it has the intro that's done by historian Mark Seaman. Uh, and then it's also funny, I wanted to mention this is my last thing, was that one of my sources actually was the MI5, like, .government.uk website. They have a page about Agent Garbo. It's like, I can't believe I'm on, like, fucking oh, MI5 oh website. Um, I'm like, this That's is so cool. cool. <laughs> I was like, oh, so cool. And <laughs> all I wanted to include from them was right at the beginning of their page, it said, it had a notice saying, the service does not reveal the names of its agents unless the agents themselves have publicized their identity with us, as Garbo did in 1985 in publishing publishing his own autobiography operation garbo under his own name that i would love to read yeah so he he's written an autobiography called operation garbo okay um, yes like, so cool. cool i want to read it and it was like that's so cool they literally have a notice being like we would not have revealed his name but he already said his name um yeah and it's like on their website on mi pod's website being like yeah he's an agent and they have a whole summary like autobiography basically of his life they have breakdowns on all the fake um spies that worked under him and all this stuff a whole lot of detail on that website it was crazy yeah wouldn't you want to be remembered especially after you're out of danger you're dead you're gonna be gone well he was hiding he was basically in hiding for the next 40 years of his life and then only when that reporter found him did he kind of come forward and be like okay like yeah the nazis basically die out like it's pretty safe i can say like what we did which is really cool yeah i had a lot of fun looking this up i think it's pretty wild and yeah. yeah like he had a whole lifetime of achievements <laughs> yeah it was so interesting and yeah i think i'm gonna try and get like his autobiography or something on my kindle and i can read it i think it'd be really interesting yeah. um no he's pretty cool that was a pretty good like he's like the ultimate yeah. double agent almost <laughs> yeah it was so cool and him starting out on his own and then getting accepted in with the british after he'd kind of proven himself already it's pretty yeah cool. yeah well that was good <laughs> yeah hopefully you guys enjoyed we'll take a quick break and we'll come back for more spies yay spies 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 <laughs> No. we are back mm-hmm. <laughs> alright I'm going to tell you about a cool story that uh, is about some people that were very stealthy if not outright actual spies per se <laughs> yeah 
Yeah. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> they were nicknamed the Night Witches. So that's that's pretty cool. Which is right cool. There. Yeah, that's... I like it. <laughs> all I know is that, and they fly planes. That's all I know. Because <laughs> that was what I think you had told me before. I was like, that sounds so cool. Yeah, it it was a really interesting story that you're like, I've never heard this before. Um, and yeah, that's kind of what we focused on last time. We did spies. We did both doing female spies, I think, which was cool. Yeah. And here I go again. No. <laughs> <laughs> Repping the women's. But uh, so they were not called that by themselves. They were called the 588th, like the 588th Night Bomber Regiment. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. And what was cool about them was that they were an all female unit. And it basically said, or it says most places that they dropped more than 23,000 uh, bombs or tons of bombs on Nazi targets during the attempted invasion of the Soviet Union in World War II. Jeez, <clears throat> that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, they did a lot. They did a lot. <laughs> um, the women in Russia or the USSR at the time, uh, a lot of them wanted to fight. And that's pretty cool. I thought it worth noting, I guess. But of course they weren't allowed to because got some boobs and you're banned from combat (laughs) because of the times, of course. In case you get your period. (laughs) Right, yeah. Um, But then Hitler launched Hitler launched Operation Barbarossa which I think we may have mentioned uh, once because I think yeah. I remember talking about it maybe in the abandoned places episode because I did um, Hitler's uh, Bunker. Yeah. I was like, that there. name sounds familiar and I don't know a lot about World War II, so. Yeah, and it kind of sounds like Barbosa, and you kind of can't. Yeah. <laughs> Pirates of the Caribbean. Yeah. <laughs> um. So that was in Barbarossa was the invasion of the or attempted invasion of the Soviet Union in June of 1941. Okay. So that's why they were eventually allowed to fight. Um, They were like, damn it. (laughs) We're starting to run out of men. No. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I do know that one of the regiment's missions uh, the following year, on June 28, 1942, was targeted at the headquarters of the invading Nazis. Um, nice. But there's so much cool shit that it's, there's not time to get into it all. <laughs> no. Um, but here's, we got to tell you how it came about. The all-female regiment was the brainchild of a major Marina Raskova, <clears throat> who earned the nickname of the basically the Soviet Amelia Earhart is what she gets called. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah. It's pretty cool. <laughs> um, there's a picture of her on the drive. Cause there's a picture of a couple of them. Um, as the first female navigator, apparently in the whole Soviet air force. Um, I guess there was not that there wasn't uh, like, I know there was other women, flying at the time but i don't know maybe she was she definitely was one of the one of the best (laughs) um she was really good at her job she had earned many long distance flight records during her service um and also at the time many civilians just really liked to fly because you remember Mm. because planes didn't always go as high and just yeah like in Lindbergh's day like his wife like we read about was bopping around in planes and other people <clears throat> they're just doing it for fun <laughs> um but yeah there was like flying clubs and stuff so she um ended up receiving many letters from female civilians that wanted to be a part of the action and so they wrote to Marina Raskova hoping to to persuade her to like get them in somehow (laughs) nice yeah um they'd previously been only allowed to help in support roles so 
kind of on the edges, but not actually part of the frontline combat. Um, but many of these women were motivated because they had already lost loved ones, so they were yeah. just sad. Yeah, they wanted to fight for their country, of course. <clears throat> um, and oh, I know some wars it seemed like the people were just getting used almost as cannon fodder, so it's, it sucks because like, yeah. so many people were dying. Um, they had like 2,000 applications come in. And in October 1941, Stalin gave the approval to deploy three female Air Force units. Woohoo! <laughs> they would be allowed to finally fly and actually take part in the fight for once. Nice. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of just helping transfer planes and ammunition, which apparently was one of the only things they were allowed to do before that. Hmm. After which, like, the men yeah. would take over. Yeah. You want to do like something more active, play yeah. more active role in it, right? I feel like you're doing something. Um, Marina Roskova personally interviewed each applicant, and most were students between the ages of seventeen and twenty-six, which is kind of heartbreaking. Yeah, that's very young. It is, yeah. <clears throat> Um, then 400 women were chosen and moved to Angles, uh, which was north of Stalingrad, which is now, or again, back to it, one of its original names, Volgograd. It's, it was confusing. <laughs> yeah. It was, it I'm not, I don't know. I just know some of the cities had been renamed, so I went to look it up because I was like, yeah, hey, is that like a different name today <laughs> um and there they trained at what was called the angle school of aviation but they were trained like a very very fast crash course like in a few months mm. they were yeah nice yeah what usually people had several years for so that sounds was about right yeah it's, yeah there's pictures of them like it's like crazy training notes. people because they yeah. need they just need to keep pumping people out into the war effort. Right. Ugh. Oh, yeah, one at least one thing I read said that they had to learn all four roles associated with, like, I guess the bomber unit itself. They had to train as the pilots, the navigators, the maintenance, and the, and the ground crew so that they could know and jump in on any okay. of the roles, I think. I mean, that's yeah. a good idea, because if somebody gets injured or something happens, you... Yeah, and I, from the amount of um, missions they were doing, sounds like they probably, like, were switching off also yeah. to keep up. Like, you're doing this this time, or whatever, yeah. Nice, yeah. You can do it all. <laughs> um, But <laughs> it's kind of a funny picture when they talk about how big they're... They had hand-me-down uniforms that were from the men, so they were, like, swimming in their outfits. Is that <laughs> and... why the one girl has it, like, cinched at the waist with a belt? Does it look like... really, like, baggy? I didn't really notice. <laughs> yeah. It's just the, the aviation school <clears throat> one that's labeled. I can see she mm. has, like, a belt. Uh, it looks like oh. it's in the middle of the shirt like, where your waist would be. <laughs> Oh, they did anything. They had to, like, um, I said they had to stuff their shoes with rags to keep them to stay on their feet because the shoes were too big. Oh, my God. And, oh. yeah, the one, the, one of the first, <clears throat> I listened to a few different podcasts on it, but one of the, one of the ones I remember, they said, like, they were doing the drills and they, like, had to do a bout face, but then, like, their shoes would, like, stay facing the direction <laughs> they were. <laughs> oh, my God. Facing almost, if they weren't, like stuffed properly <clears throat> yeah it's like it must have looked like children playing dress up <laughs> jeez <laughs> yeah <clears throat> um they flew these little polikarpov uh po2 biplanes which had been designed to be used for crop dusting in the 1920s oh i've seen those yeah mm. It's like they a look cliche two-person plane. Yeah, there's yeah. there's a picture of one of them. Yeah, it's 
very old timey mm -hmm. to use my technical term <laughs> uh but they were two cedars uh, so they were made of plywood and canvas <laughs> oh so <laughs> scary so that just gets me uh so that's why they called them coffins with wings <laughs> Oh, jeez. No. Yeah. <laughs> How are they dropping bombs out of those? Where does the bomb even go? <laughs> One under each wing. <laughs> <clears throat> That's all they could carry. Yeah. That's scary. Mm -hmm. Dropping bombs they... out of plywood. I <laughs> know, right? They must have had some metal on them. Because, well, like, it's it said... But they were never intended to see combat, clearly. But because yeah, they no, it. <laughs> they're not what you imagine when you think about planes being involved in any sort of warfare. Open my door, you poopers. Uh, no. <laughs> um, they must have had some sort of metal. <clears throat> I mean, obviously, probably like the propellers or whatever, or a coating. Mm -hmm. Um, because when they would, it would get so cold there because Russia, um, that if they were like to touch it with their bare skin, of course they oh. would like rip their skin off. <laughs> Jeez. As I learned, when you never lick a playground pole in the winter. <laughs> yeah. Just to Don't see if that is true. <laughs> never. Uh, <clears throat> so due to a lack of funds. And also the small carrying capacity of their paper planes. They could not carry <laughs> parachutes, radios, radar, or guns. Oh my so. god. It's bad. <laughs> it's pretty rough. <laughs> <clears throat> it's, yeah, it's like yours. You're, you have like blow up stuff and I have like paper yeah. <laughs> Oh my god, World War II was crazy. <laughs> I guess radios and everything must have been bigger, so I can... First I was like, Ooh. they couldn't have a radio, but I assume it's probably like a large or different object. Yeah, that's crazy. They have like nothing with them it's... up there. Yeah, the electronics are certainly not state-of-the-art. <laughs> no, they have their eyes in each other, basically. Just They're like an old they beat-up Ford in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> oh jeez well actually that's what somebody was joking on the one thing i was listening to because of the way they can't their max speed is not much more than your <laughs> like your oh, average God. car can go faster <clears throat> jesus yeah <laughs> 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 their max height well we'll talk about it. their max height or ceiling was uh nine thousand eight hundred feet so just under ten thousand feet <laughs> um so they had to fly very low because of this and because they couldn't carry any of the other instruments they had to use paper pencils rulers compasses stopwatches flashlights to you know navigate and all that fun stuff oh my god <laughs> Just picture yeah. you breaking out like a protractor and a ruler in the sky. Yeah. And then you let go of the paper and it flies out of the plane. And you're like, no! Early air travel was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, the Luftwaffe command called the plane. And then, well, first it has it in the Russian Cerulean or whatever. And then, <gasps> in yeah, no, I don't know. <laughs> Russia, help my sister. <laughs> she speaks it. Russian plywood is what they called it. So I guess that's oh, how they got their nickname. But And the, the Luftwaffe also gave awards for each downed aircraft that they, like, each of the oh, girls, wow. women they could get down. Not that they knew they were women, but. So they were very slow. Um, their top, their top speed, maximum speed, 90 miles per hour. Um, okay yeah <laughs> but the enemy planes would stall out if they went below about 100 miles per hour so uh... they were almost <laughs> they couldn't slow down enough really like to catch them very well it was a whole thing <laughs> sounds like dog fighting my dad used to like the 
dog fighting in the sky or whatever my dad used to watch all these crazy there used to be a show i think on the history channel that was about different oh like dog fights and stuff that happened in the sky and it was all it was quite a few times planes like these and Mm -hmm. they were talking about like trying to shoot each other down and they're doing all these like acrobatics in the sky and it's just insane it's a deadly air show yeah yeah I wouldn't want to do it. <laughs> no. Oh, God, no. And we're so brave. <laughs> yeah. So, if you're wondering, yes, why are they called the Night Witches? So, because they had to fly so low, and they're slow. They had to go in the dark. And mm-hmm. uh, it was very dark. So, the, there you get your, your night part. <laughs> well... It'll, it comes down to the sound they make. They don't make very much sound, which we'll get to in just a second here. Um, mm. But it's also dangerous. Like, if they get hit by um, a tracer bullet, then they might, like, they'll go up like an actual paper plane because those type of bullets were apparently mm-hmm. incendiary so that they could be, like, tracked. You see the spark as it go, flies <gasps> across Whoa. the sky. So it would, like, hit them and then just, <clears throat> like, burn them up and you know they couldn't carry parachutes all that wood yeah oh my god they have no parachutes oh my god it's bad it's terrible like they have the shittiest equipment (laughs) they're like yeah you guys can play at war here you go here's nothing and a chunk of plywood go fly in the sky now (laughs) you have our best wishes (laughs) yeah fuck Thoughts and um, prayers. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <clears throat> so each night, 40, 40 different two person teams would each go out on multiple missions or sorties. And each pair would do from anywhere from 8 to 18 um, missions or sorties per night and dropping wow. two bombs each time. Yeah. That's a lot. Per efficient. <laughs> um, yeah, I heard things like if the bomb didn't get out, properly that they'd have to get out onto the wing and kick it like it's (laughs) real crazy mission impossible bullshit (laughs) oh yeah so they're coming in at night they're like low-hanging fruit but they're they're trying to be stealthy as they can so one team would swoop in um probably making a sputtering like an old toyota i put (laughs) but that would draw the attention of the germans and their spotlights and their any fire would would draw to the first plane and that plane would drop a flare next to the um, target to mark it for the the next team coming in so then as they're gliding off or flying off then the second team would come in from behind cut their engines and then glide in like basically silently with the oh nice and it would just go whoosh and they said they sounded like knocked hexen knocked hexen or night witches i don't know my german not so good (laughs) that's pretty cool yeah they're like just silent just this faint whooshing i'm like oh i love this it's so creepy (laughs) yeah (laughs) um but uh to be fair, some of them didn't really like the nickname so much because they're like, it's demeaning. You're like, we don't have no magic. We have the least amount of things we're working with. This is a <laughs> skill. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> this was cute. They had 12 commandments. And I guess the first one was be proud you are a woman. I don't know Aww, the rest. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. yeah. Um. Most things said that they painted flowers on their planes and, you know, kept feminine touches like using their navigation pencils as eyeliner, which is pretty interesting. Not safe. I don't know what kind of pencils they are. Maybe it was just a chalk. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. Okay. So there's a second in command to Marina and. So she's like the second hen mother. And her name is Yevdokia Bershanskia. It's hard. Russian's hard, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> so she's the second in command of the 588th uh, Regiment. 
and she went by Doc, so we're gonna call her Doc. <laughs> That's better. Oh, okay. Doc or Doak, you know, shortened nickname, or shortened version of her first name. Um, um, and her husband had died in the war, like many of the other women fighting in the regiment. Hmm, yeah. So that was a tough decision for her to decide whether or not she was gonna keep, like go to fight now that she was the sole yeah. provider for her child but she put him with her grandparents <clears throat> her son alexi and they they lived in like the ural mountains so they weren't really in a city i don't think they were a little bit safer well yeah <laughs> safe ish <laughs> we'll see you know it's war so yeah it's tends to go everywhere yeah yeah um and i did read that yeah it was the 588th that had all women but then there were some women and also the 587th um regiment also but the 588 uh the one that got it was all females and had all the worst equipment was it was basically because they were did the worst in the aviation training school <laughs> so they were given the worst oh. shit <laughs> And I thought that was an interesting point. But then they like did they also, the best. But they also Basically. forced them through it, like super rushed and everything. So Oh yeah. That doesn't and, help. Like, they, and they totally performed under the pressure. Like yeah. um we'll get to some of their they have I have some of their achievements here. Um but yeah, despite all that, of course they faced sexism and sexual harassment and all the fun stuff oh all yeah the time and it actually got like downright nefarious to the point where they were really um endangering the women sometimes <clears throat> um on one of the first real missions they were sabotaged by the men who were told to to fly with them to escort the ladies but the the ladies didn't know that they were going to have an escort so they some of the planes got spooked and they broke their formation and then the men just mm. used that as an excuse to be like we'll see they can't they don't know what they're doing but like oh my god that, yeah yeah mm -hmm. and if you Shit don't have like radios that. up there to communicate that'd be pretty difficult yeah like i don't even like what following behind somebody when you're driving somebody's like oh just get in your car <laughs> and follow me oh i'll drive you just follow me in your car no <clears throat> this never is we're not geese <laughs> yeah. get out of here right. just give me the address i'll punch it in my gps and then i'll follow behind you and if we get separated i yeah. won't care exactly <laughs> oh uh... can't do it <laughs> So they got put off for a while, but then they eventually did get to actually go on a real mission after that happened. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, the w Wikipedia had a summary of their uh, their numbers throughout the course of the war. It, it, they said the regiment accumulated approximately 23,672 sorties in combat, including in the following battles. The Battle of the caucasus that's a word i never said out loud before today <laughs> caucasus <laughs> caucasus uh and that one they had 2920 sorties in kuban taman oh god these are big words noborysiysk 4623 sorties the crimean offensive uh 6140 sorties the belarus offensive 400 sorties poland offensive uh 5421 sorties and the german offensive 2000 sorties um and then in total the regiment collectively accumulated 28,676 flight hours dropped over 3000 wow. 3, tons of bombs that's what it is Jeez, okay. the tonnage seemed off at the first because <laughs> it's like 2300 missions but not anyway uh... 2600 incendiary shells damaging or completely destroying 17 river crossings nine railways two railway stations 26 warehouses 12 fuel depots 176 armored cars 
86 firing points and 11 searchlights. Um, Jeez, in addition to bombings, <laughs> yeah, the unit performed 155 drops of food and ammunition to Soviet forces. So, yeah, they did some good. <laughs> yeah, just a bit. Yeah, <laughs> in their little paper planes. Um, yeah, gosh. And they did lose some, of course, but only about 30 from the overall 400. So, wow. Wasn't bad. Yeah, could have been worse considering. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> um, tragically, the the brainchild of it, the Maria Major Maria Raskova, died mm -hmm. en route to the battlefield in a, like a tragic flight accident um, on January first. Oh, okay. Yeah, this was in nineteen forty three. She had been leading other PO two planes to the airfield near Stalingrad. Where, when she was required to try and make a forced landing and they crashed and the entire crew was killed. So that one sucked. <laughs> yeah, that's sad. Yeah, and then that was devastating for, for Doc, um, to her second in command. So she had to like walk outside and hide from, she wanted to hide her emotions from the girls when she found out the news. <clears throat> but uh, Maria Ruskova received the first state funeral of the war, so that they honored her. Um, the Nazis, of course, had to deal with the night witches and also the winter, and the cold was killing them just as almost as yeah. fast. <laughs> they said that 130,000 Nazis died or were sent home with frostbite or minus like an appendage or two. Hopefully not Jeez. their favorite one. <laughs> and yeah. But like, at least the Russians are a little bit more used to it. <laughs> yeah, they're um, like us Canadians. <laughs> yeah, we get winter pretty hard in some places. <laughs> and once spring hit, then the mud prevented the planes from taking off. So they had to like jerry rig mm. a runway out of logs and stuff like that. And then just oh, run God. everything to the plane craziness <clears throat> oh and this was fun i thought this it was interesting that one night uh as they were huddling for warmth in their little makeshift makeshift barracks uh, a wolf cub wandered in you know because russia <laughs> it like came in with the wind and the cold it blew in and they Aww. fed him apparently throughout the Aww. night apparently with bread and chocolate which why but Anyway, <laughs> I don't have more details other than the, the mother. They heard the mother. Um, mm, yeah, I got that be careful. Or, yeah, they did. So they didn't keep him. <laughs> <clears throat> but they also like once took in this small child that was in a, a city that had been demolished and they were walking through or whatever. And he he ran away from them and then they took him in and they all miss their own kids so they called him misha and he like acted like they were all his mothers and was like so protective of them when they'd go off to Aww. their missions and then they like eventually like they taught him to read and stuff and then they sent him off to military school jesus that's adorable <laughs> <I know. laughs> it's so crazy the stories um <clears throat> their final flight was on may 4th 1945 three days before Germany surrendered. Um, I guess. hope that's right. That's what I had. <laughs> I'm not good with the dates. Because, <laughs> whatever. And 24 of them would receive the Medal of Honor. Um, they were awarded with the title of a Guards Regiment, which is apparently a high honor. Um, they became known as the 46th Taman Guards Night Bomber Aviation Regiment of the Soviet Air Forces. <clears throat> Officially. Um, it's a long name. Yeah. <laughs> but I think they liked, Doc especially liked that better than the Night Witches. Um, yeah. She, yeah. She cried. They gave her the flag or whatever. The, doing a, a little ceremony or whatever. And, you know, given that to her and her troops. And she was so proud of them that they were the first female regiment to receive this honor in the Soviet Union. 
so they partied that night <laughs> you know a little vodka they probably i think they cried nasterovia <laughs> um and then that gave them kind of a boost and then they were like working with a different division the north caucus why all the caucuses <laughs> sounds like politics what are we? Yeah, I was just gonna say, what are we, the Senate or the House, whatever? I don't know government. what's going on here. Um, and they were stationed with the male regiment, and this time doing the same sorties as the men in the same planes. So that was a bonus. <laughs> That's good. And... They got an upgrade. Yeah. <laughs> These are a little safer. Can we have a parachute now? <laughs> yeah. Fucking radio. <laughs> a luxury. Uh, so, but because they'd been performing without these kind of luxuries, the female uh, 588th Bomber Regiment performed better than the male one consistently when they were doing yeah. the same <laughs> type of stuff. Um, and they were just able to do more missions and I'm going to assume probably did those better just based on what they did so far. <laughs> but like, it said that the men would be having the dinner and smoking and then the women of the 588th would be eating in their cockpit so that they'd be like ready to go they were that dedicated yeah i feel like that's just what women do they just they like adapt figure it out and then they like get as good as they can at it and they just we could be biased but yeah (laughs) yeah we do what we do um the two there was two base commanders that actually fought over who got to keep them one time and one <laughs> offered the other two male units if he could just keep the, the females Aww. for longer. <laughs> oh, that probably made them feel great. I like that. Right? Like redemption. Yeah. Um, when one of the girls got to their 500th flight, uh, she was gifted wow. a watermelon with one of their planes <laughs> carved into the front of it. They couldn't afford cake, okay? <laughs> I was just gonna say watermelon is probably really fancy in Russia. Like, I mean, it probably they gave all the chocolate there. And... Yeah, they gave the chocolate to the the wolf. <laughs> yeah, and then they raised a child together. <laughs> like... Yeah, that's probably uh, where the rest of the chocolate went if they had any rations. Yeah, <sighs> they taught him to read. That blows my mind. That's so cute. Well. Now I have to sandwich in a darker fact in the middle. So (laughs) do that thing. Um, They, well, if they did happen to get shot down or captured, they would be tortured and treated way worse than any male counterpart. You know, usually if they were like a prisoner, they they might be raped. It it was really bad. Yeah. Um, But on the other funnier side, they, if they captured a German soldier, like they wouldn't always believe that a woman shot them down. So <laughs> that was kind of funny. I um, like that. Yeah. She rips they... off a fake beard and mustache and it's like, ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They like started a rumor or thought that, oh, they must be getting secret injections so that they have night vision. <laughs> or <laughs> they're just eating or... their carrots. <laughs> Yeah. I think that comes from some weird conspiracy too. The carrots giving you better eyesight. That might come from some propaganda. Somebody was talking about that the other day, but I don't remember. I think it might come I thought from it was because it boosts like one of the vitamins or whatever, and one of those um, vitamins is responsible for eye health. That's like fucking all it is. Okay. Yeah. Could be. It just That's like weird. promotes healthy eyes. Like it just helps. There is weird no. food myths, though. Sometimes it's like, yeah. we think this thing is like way better than it is. And it was like, no. I felt like that every time I used to, my mom was obsessed with Dr. Oz when I used to live with them. Oh, and really? I'd sit there every day, and every day it was a new cancer-fighting superfood, what you need oh. to eat. And I was like, fucking, it can't be something different every day, okay, Dr. Oz? This is good food. And by the way, good foods are cancer-fighting superfoods. So we're just going to feature one every day. Yeah. yeah. It's e- <laughs> Okay, it basically was just eat fucking vegetables and <laughs> yeah. fruit. Eat a, balanced, eat a balanced diet. 
Like, that's, <laughs> yeah. That's that'll be the only nutrition thing I ever believe in is eat a balanced diet mm-hmm. of everything. Like, yeah. eat whatever you want. Moderation. As long as you... Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you eat only, though. if you only eat fruits and vegetables, you're probably going to be missing out on a lot of like protein and stuff like oh, that. Yeah. There's always a trade off that you're going to lose out on. So just eat, mm-hmm. eat a good amount and some of everything. That's so we're omnivores. <laughs> yeah. Well, they were eating whatever they could get their hands on, I'm sure, because <laughs> war time. Yeah. Oh, but the other fun rumor or whatever was that they were all ex-cons on a punishment work release sort of program. And what? you know, that's why they were all they're all thieves and top you know criminal masterminds and that must be why they're so good at flying these stealth missions in these planes because <laughs> they couldn't possibly even if just that be good was, at it even if that was true like how does that necessarily mean you're gonna be good at that i don't know i just couldn't believe it <laughs> yeah jeez yeah i mean so it's it's had its ups and downs that's for sure they were apparently disbanded within six months after the war and sadly not even invited to the big victory or peace parade or whatever parade in moscow oh that's shitty because they said that their planes would be too slow yeah (laughs) why but I'm sure they still celebrated after the war was over, and they said that they like lit off flares and made fireworks, and I assume again nice. vodka was consumed. Yeah. Um, and then Doc was eventually reunited with her little boy. Uh, it was scary because they heard that her village, her parents' village, had been attacked, and so they like um... went looking for him, and then was like, "Oh my God, he's still alive!" and found him there, which was pretty crazy. Do and if we have time, I have a little shallow dive into one of the girls who had a cool nickname because <laughs> they're all cool and there was so many to talk about. But that's yeah, that's I the think main we have time. Oh yeah. Um, but just this uh, other one girl, her name was Lydia Litviak, probably how you say it. But the, she got the nickname the White Lily of Stalingrad. You know we like lilies. Yeah. <laughs> um, and she I don't know, a little bit of her backstory because she was born in Moscow in 1921, and her father was arrested as an enemy of the people during the Great Purge, which was also called the Great Terror, um, which was the Sounds Soviet fun. fun. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so much fun because you know Stalin. It was his campaign to solidify his power over the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and the state. And her father was never seen again. So that reminded me kind of of your guy. Like his mother. They were kidnapped. They broke her out at least. But yeah. Right. Okay. That was a little bit better. Sort of. I don't know. You can't really compare, I guess. Um, she had joined a flying club at the age of 14 and had her first solo flight at 15. Oh my um, god, no. <laughs> yes! Like my daughter's age, oh my god. <laughs> she doesn't even want to drive her- a car. <laughs> <sighs> What's that? Sorry. Oh, I was going to say, can you imagine just yeah. flying in a plane out of made out of plywood and paper? Friggin' 15. <laughs> better ones for the flying school (laughs) no probably um then she started as a flight instructor at kalinin air club and had trained 45 pilots by the time the german soviet war began so that's cool um and she was initially of course denied joining an aviation unit when the germans attacked uh which was in june of 1941 sorry that was a little kind of repetitive but Yeah, she didn't want to let her in, and she lied and added 100-plus hours to her flight experience and then joined the the 588 Bomber Regiment (laughs) and flew her first combat flight in summer of 1942. 
And then in September of that year, she was reassigned to a men's regiment uh, fighting over Stalingrad. She was like really good, I guess. Um, Cause she and three other women were moved near the river Volga, but the base was empty and under attack. So they're like, okay, moving on. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, thanks for sending us here. <laughs> Um, then he moved to Srednaya Aktuba, maybe. And there she was <laughs> flying a Yak-1, which is a different kind of plane, I guess. Um, and I think they were a little better than the, the PO2 paper planes yeah, or whatever. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, she's with like the men's unit right now. Um, she flew the number 32 and was kicking some serious ass there because this guy boris yeriman a regimental commander in her division and later lieutenant general of aviation said she was a very aggressive person and a born fighter pilot <laughs> nice yeah like There's that a picture of her yeah she's a little firecracker um when she scored her first two kills on September 13th in Stalingrad, she became the first female fighter pilot to shoot down an enemy aircraft. Um, cool. Said, yeah, like that's pretty cool. Uh, that was when she shot down a BF 109 G2 Gustav on her. That was on her flight commander's tail. Her flight commander was Raisa Belyeva. I'm just butchering all the Russian. Sorry, Russia. Uh, <laughs> they're not listening anyway. <laughs> yeah. The staff sergeant. Who was this now? Okay. Yeah, this is who she sat down. The staff sergeant, Erwin Meyer, of the second Staffel of. Oh my God, there was this German. It's like Jadjes Schwader. <laughs> There's like a G, a D, and then a G. Like, you tell me how we pronounce that. I don't know. <laughs> but i like to say luftwaffe that's a fun one he was a, a luftwaffe fighter wing of world war ii or that was a luftwaffe fighter wing of world war ii that's who he was part of um and he was the one he was shot down and then he thought they were taking the piss out of him and saying that a woman shot him down oh. he, said, he said he wanted to see the russian ace that shot him down and then she came out and he was like what the fuck <laughs> excuse me yeah, and so she had to, like, give him up blow by blow, play by play of, like, I did this, and then that, and then you did that, and then he was like, oh, okay, oh I guess God. he did. Jeez. <laughs> Although it is debated, and others do say that a different woman was the first one to, sh like, shoot down a enemy, uh, a f the first female fighter pilot, so it might have been a Lieutenant Valeria Komyakova, who was... Uh, part of the 586 regiment so you tell me i don't know there's debate i guess <laughs> but i like that it might be the white lily yeah um and on the 22nd of march she was wounded in a retaliation attack after she shot uh one one guy down and then it was six yak ones versus 12 bf 109s and she landed but lost a lot of blood that day so she was wounded then and then on august 1st 1943 she did not return to base at krasny luch from her fourth sortie of the day um and she had been escorting a flight of ilvision 91 2. they all have such big names <laughs> yeah <laughs> ground aircraft as the Soviets were returning to base near Oral, a pair of BF-109 fighters dove on Litviak, uh, Lydia, while she was attacking a large group of German bombers. So, uh, this guy remembers uh, <laughs> Ivan Borensenko, who was another Soviet pilot, and he said, Lily just didn't see the Messerschmitt 109s flying cover for the German bombers. A pair of them dove on her, and when she did see them, she turned to meet them and then they all disappeared behind a cloud hmm. yeah and he was too busy fighting but he glimpsed her going down and uh her plane was pouring smoke Jeez. just have to keep kicking the door don't you <laughs> <laughs> he just woke himself up <laughs> 
Gordo um, did that. I like he was laying <laughs> beside me in his little basket thing I put there for him. Yeah. And then <laughs> I think I said something and or laughed, fucking scared him. And he's like, oh, whoa, God. Startled oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, geez, Gordo. I think what Brandmere just did was stretched and then accidentally kicked the door a little and then he saw the door opening and was like, What's happening? <laughs> Cute. Yeah. <laughs> um but yeah, unfortunately he couldn't find uh Lydia. She was believed to have been maybe taken captive. Um they searched apparently for quite some time, like some years before her aircraft was even found after the war. Oh wow. Yeah, but some people say that they think they saw her with German soldiers walking, being walked away from the crash site. Um, so she could have been um, taken captive. And um, what was this? There was a whole website of theories and a PhD in Ottawa says that she was seen in a POW camp and maybe living like a prisoner of war camp. Sorry. And maybe living in Switzerland nowadays. Like they think she actually did live and then married a Swede and had three kids and is living in Switzerland. Um, especially because there was a broadcast. Yeah. Well, there was a. They thought they saw her on TV because there was a lady that was talking about stuff and someone thought they might have recognized her and she wouldn't give her last name and stuff. But that was the only real proof, I, I guess. Was- no, yeah. I always find that kind of stuff so weird. It's like, okay, yeah. like the war's been over. How long do you think they wouldn't just come out and be like, this is me? Like, yeah, why? the only thing I heard about that was that apparently Stalin really looked down on people that got captured as prisoners of war. I think he wanted you to rather fucking off yourself than let your self get taken i don't know it seemed like there was a stigma to it but that was the only theory i was hmm, with maybe. As to why maybe she wouldn't want to but yeah it's like really you yeah it was like why that? put your like family and friends through thinking you're dead for yeah. the rest of their lives that's true that's true like, if you had any family left <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah but she was really cool, so I hope so. Like I would, I would hope she. Would yeah, be still alive. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> nice, oh, so cool. It is cool, and also I now want to go by uh, one of the podcasts that covered this has um, one of their fans did a T-shirt, and I can buy a Night Witches merch. Oh. It's like a little drawing of like. <laughs> A witchy figure on like one of the planes and i'm like oh it's so cute <laughs> that's cool it is it's on the um this is when they covered this on the crime diner pod that's where i most recently heard it before i was doing some research and then i was like wait there's a shirt <laughs> yeah not too Maybe often you can get merch for one of our cases i know and they covered one of the i think they covered a cult that you had covered the Mexico one and so then there was food to do with one of your cases and I was like oh that's oh. fun <laughs> yeah like the blood what was she the princess of the blood um, or something yeah those. I can't remember her name right now Magdalena something hard to pronounce <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah but anyway that was a fun one thanks for sticking with us and yeah Guess we'll see you next week for something very special and near and dear to my heart. It's the time slippies. Yeah. Yeah. I think they're sometimes called time anomalies too, but I like time slips. <laughs> I think of the time warp. Let's do yes. the time warp again. I know. My title is let's do the time slips again <laughs> that's my <laughs> title <laughs> oh we're on I the think same I, <laughs> I think i have it saved as time warp but my <laughs> notes are i googled time slips because i was like if i just google the time warp it's just gonna come up with rocky horror picture show <laughs> yeah <laughs> nice <laughs> all right well 
We'll catch you next time. <laughs> yeah. Bye. Oops. <laughs>